Hi everybody! Welcome to a simple ray tracer with the Apache Beam Go SDK. I'm Robert Burke, and I'm on the Google Dataflow team, and I work on the Apache Beam Go SDK. I'm delighted to show you the SDK with a ray tracer as the motivating example. I'll warn you though, I'm not a graphics professional, I'm merely an enthusiast. You'll see why I say that in a moment. Let's go over what I hope you get out of this talk. First, I hope you come away with a light understanding of how ray tracers work. Second, I hope you see how easy it is to write one with the Beam Go SDK. Third, I'm going to show you how to divide the work of ray tracing using a splittable do fun. Fourth, I'll show you how I iterate on my ray tracer uh, using counters, loopback mode, and CPU profiling. And finally, a little bit of proof that it works on a distributed runner like Google Cloud Dataflow. But remember, Google Cloud Dataflow doesn't currently support the Go SDK, so disclaimer. Um, thank you for bearing with this grab bag of topics, but it's a lot to cover, so let's get started. For those of you who don't know, ray tracing is a way of generating high quality, physically accurate images using math. You've almost certainly seen a movie that uses them. Just think of anything Pixar has done. Ray tracing differs from more common rasterization methods to render images in that they simulate light rays in a physically accurate way. Because they're simulating light, if we are simulating it accurately, we get tons of effects for free. Things like caustics, reflections, soft shadows, and indirect lighting or global illumination, those stark brights, soft colors, and color bleed. To make the computations go faster, but still on the whole accurate, we use randomized sampling techniques. In essence, uh, this kind of ray tracing is an application of Monte Carlo integration, which relies on randomness to get a picture of the whole scene. Pardon the pun. This image is the kind of image that my ray tracer can currently make, um, which, as you can see, can just render arbitrary words in a room with uh, some neat sunlight coming from above. But how do we simulate light? Well, light moves predictably. It's mostly in straight lines. This makes it easy enough to simulate. It also works the same in both directions. This means once we've set up the camera, we can trace light rays from the camera back to the lights to see where the rays come from. But it's not entirely that way. Not all light is direct. Some, some of it might be coming from other sources, like bouncing off of other objects, which changes how it looks. So for example, uh, our light ray first hit the teapot there, and it's getting contributions from other places, like the wine bottle which in turn is bouncing back to the teapot, and so on and so forth, uh, with each contribution checking and the contribution of the lights from the scene. And we do this for each pixel and sample. Um, here's about what I said before, the bits I didn't explain before, where that first we need to, you know, read in the scene and its configuration options and set up the camera. Um, after we've rendered all the pixels and set all the colors, we save the image. So how does that look in code? Well, um, as first we're going to look at it as a single threaded ray tracer. The ray tracer is very simple and it can only do one scene, uh, a word in a room with some reflective spheres. Uh, we can configure a word from the command line because I've used constructive solid geometry to model the alphabet. Um, all the code that I'm showing you today is up on my GitHub repo, which uh, I've got the link helpfully right there. Uh, this is a hobby, so it'll change over time as I update the ray tracer and as the BeamGo SDK evolves. So let's get to the code. Not that button, that button. So let's go see this ordinary ray tracer. Um, da, da, da. Adjusting some windows here, thank you. Um, so while we're waiting, 
Or while I'm showing you the code, let's start a, a run of this code. So I'm like, you can see that it works. Uh, we can see how far it's getting done because I have this little mark progress helper method that is going to print things out based on uh, percentages of the number of pixels completed. So you can follow that down here. Um, but otherwise, as I said, we get our image configuration, our origin, our camera origin, and then we build the scene based on whatever word that we're doing. In this case, I'm using the word word. Uh, we initialize that scene properly so that everything is ready to go. But otherwise, we then create an image and start going pixel by pixel. And then for each pixel, we cast whatever number of samples we're making raise. For example, here, we're going to go ahead and do that 16 times per pixel. Uh, each pixel uh, gets a ray with a little bit of randomness associated with it. And then we just trace that ray through the scene up to the number of bounces, which in this case is five. When we're done, we add the result to our accumulated color. And once we've got all the samples, we map the color back to a reasonable color space. Uh, this, in this case, is called using Reinhardt tone mapping. Uh, once we have the fully accumulated color, we do one last mapping uh, to get it back down to um, a 32-bit color and set the pixel to that color. And that's when we uh, mark our progress. Oh, look, we're already around 15% done. Um, after every pixel is done, we uh, save uh, the image to wherever we've decided. Uh, technically, this implementation is a path tracer. The difference between a path tracer and a ray tracer, though, is kind of subtle. Uh, the difference is that all the rays that in a path tracer are sourced from the eye, and then they just go through their series of bounces. Unlike the little pictures I showed you before, uh, we're not casting additional rays at each bounce. Instead, we go through, trace, find an intersection, uh, in this case using a ray marching algorithm, and then we handle whatever bounce is happening with the material here, and then we recurse as a loop up until uh, the bounce limit. Right there. Um, yeah, uh, pretty much the same thing. Just everything, uh, there's a lot more repeated work. We could make things a little faster by avoiding it, but doing things this way uh, makes it easier to scale later on. Uh, the important thing is that we are taking a certain number of samples per pixel. As for writing the file, because some of you might be interested in that, uh, we create a file. I've got uh, Beam provides a file system abstraction here. Uh, you just we take the file, we open the actual file that we want for writing, we write the image in this case PNG encoded, and then we just flush the buffers and close things out. Uh, pretty straightforward. So. How does this change thing change when you turn it into a beam pipeline? Well, let's take a look at it. Like ordinary tracer, we have beam tracer with the same set of arguments. And oh, right, that's the output directory. Uh, same set of arguments. Uh, we generate the rays. We trace our pixels, and then we combine everything at the end. Eventually, we write things out. So it's about the same, except there's no big for loop over it. <sighs> it's, you know, our image isn't done yet, only 40% complete. We'll get back to that in a minute. Or view. So that's our ordinary ray tracer. It's uh, not particularly quick as you can see. Uh, but recall that the problem we're dealing with right now is embarrassingly parallel. That means that the rays don't actually depend on each other. So we can do many, we can process them individually on multiple computers at the same time, as long as we can combine things up later. 
This means in abstract that it's very easy for us to split the work up into, which is going to be great if we want to distribute things using Beam. So how do we split this up for our workers? In this case, Beam provides something called a splittable do fun, which allows a runner to ask the user code how to do the splitting. Uh, splittable do funds are like regular do funds, but they have an extra bit of data to say how much of an element should be processed at a time. We call that extra data a restriction. What makes sense to use as a restriction depends on the element type. For a file name, it could be the number of bytes in the file that it's representing. For geographic data, it could be a division of the coordinate space. All that matters is that we're able to translate our restriction into something meaningful for us to process when we're uh, dealing with a given element. So what makes sense for a ray tracer? What I ended up with is using the image configuration as the main element. Ideally, this is fully specifying the scene from the camera configuration, number of samples, ray bounces, the objects in the scene, the materials they use. Well, that's that's what I'm using anyways. But what about the restriction? There are many options. You could divide the image into different rectangles and sample counts and handle it that way. Very easy to split and easy enough to generate the set of valid samples to work on. However, instead, uh, as you might be reading ahead on the slides here, uh, I've chosen to be a little clever and instead map everything to the number line using Beam's built-in offset range restriction. The idea is this. We take all integers from one to width times height at times samples that we're casting, and then using a bit of math to turn any one of those integers into an appropriate pixel and sample index based on our image configuration, that base element. The best part about this is, is because offset range is built into Beam, a lot of additional complexity is handled for us. So let's take a look at the code for that. So we have our Beam Tracer here. We have our generate raise uh, composite function. Uh, and also, as you can see, we're taking our image configuration and creating that and having that as our input to our generate raise splittable do fun. So let's go up to that. Generate raise SDF fun is a structural do fun. In the Go SDK, splittable do funds can become splittable, or only, sorry, only structural do funds can become splittable since they need additional helper methods to be able to deal with the restrictions. Here, we create the initial restriction as I described. We're just doing the multiplication. Uh, for splitting, uh, offset, which defines how we're doing our initial splits and possibly any dynamic splits, uh, we uh, do, 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 do. Uh, for splitting, Offset range has a couple extra helper functions, which is very useful. In this case, I'm taking the even splits method, uh, which will divide our restriction into whatever number of evenly sized chunks. There's also a sized restriction or sized set of splits, which will split things based on whatever set of size. So if you want things that only have 64 units each, it will generate. It will divide everything by 64. So you have that many uh, splits, which is very nice. Then we have our restriction size. We're not doing anything funny with the restriction size here, so it's ignoring the image config. Uh, it's just however many indices that the restriction has. Uh, here we wrap our restrictions in a restriction tracker or an R tracker. Offset range comes with its own tracker, and but it's not concurrency safe. So we built something to make it easy to, enough to wrap uh, something conforming to the tracker, in, or yeah, the R tracker interface, uh, and make it concurrency safe. This is very important for dealing with anything that does dynamic splits. And then we have our process element method. 
If you're familiar with do funds, uh, usually you'd have uh, your element, your key value pair, and then the emitter for however you're dealing with things. In this case, we have an additional parameter, the R tracker. And then what we do here is that in a loop, we take our restriction, get whatever starting point there is. In this case, it's as simple as getting the start index. And then we try and claim it uh, so that we can process it. This part is important because in some runners that might be able to dynamically split, we might not actually be allowed to work on the entirety of the restriction we've been given because half of the work has been given away somewhere. But as long as try claim returns true, uh, we can go ahead and do the math. In this case, we're taking the index and decomposing it back into our XY coordinates, recover a pixel, and then using that to calculate our array, which we then send down uh, the processing stack. And would you look at that? Our image is done. So let's take a look at what our ordinary ray tracer produced. So note how our spheres and letters are reflective and that the ground beneath some of them are is gaining some of the color. So like there's a little bit of green bleed there. I don't know if that's coming through in the recording. And I had to check that it was recording. <laughs> um, a green bleed there. Uh, so that's working as desired. You'll note that the, no uh, that the image is pretty noisy. And that's because not all rays end up getting back to uh, the light or anything brightly lit. Uh, this is the hazard of dealing with uh, reflective with uh, uh, this is the hazard of dealing with uh, well randomness. Sometimes it's not going to work out, so we need quite a bit more uh, rays to get higher quality images. But for only sixteen samples per pixel, this is pretty good. If we had more samples, this would be far less noisy. So let's go back to the slides. So what's stopping us from scaling? These gophers are very much ready to go. But first, there's a problem we need to address with, with, respect, to, with, res bah, with respect to scale. The problem comes with how we group our arrays after we've accumulated them out. So this isn't exactly what we're doing in my ray tracer right now, uh, but say this is our array object. It specifies where it's coming from, uh, what direction it's going, and what color it's currently got, as well as what pixel it's being attached to, and the IDs of these the bounces and such. This is so that we can actually properly accumulate everything back to uh, the right amount into the pixel when combining everything. Um, but the important thing is that this is about 88 bytes large if we're not encoding it more compactly. So what would happen if we were trying to group all the samples from all the bounces together? And remember, we're doing this for all the bounces. This can add up. So for an 8 megapixel image, and if we were taking 4K samples each for each pixel, and we had to store all 88 bytes for our arrays each time, that would end up with 3 terabytes of data. If you thought this was a little bit of a toy, um, well, big data, right there. <laughs> this is fine, though. This is totally fine. 3 terabytes is nothing. It's not a big deal. The way I'm generating my arrays in my pipeline ensures that samples for a given pixel are contiguous. This means that they're all adjacent together on the number line. And because we're splitting in such large blocks, if there are millions upon millions of pixels, and we're only starting with a thousand restrictions at a time, statistically, a lot of pixels are going to be within those bundles. This gives us a huge opportunity uh, for the beam, uh, the beam optimization called combiner lifting, which will shrink the data down to a pixel and a color before it even gets to the grouping operations. Very nice. Uh, 
This is a lot of words to say that if you can make sure all your values for a key are on the same worker before a group by key, you should do it. Uh, it's a way more efficient. Op it's, it's way more efficient to do because there's less work in serializing and storing the data during grouping. So how can you be sure that that's working as intended? Well, that brings us to our next section. Debugging Beam Go pipelines. And specifically, doing so locally. Any problem that you can find and prevent early saves headaches and possibly money down the road. So even with the nearly out of experimental Go SDK, hopefully version 33, <laughs> 2.33, uh, there are many options for local debugging. First is unit testing your code in the facilities of the SDK language. Just because you're using Beam doesn't mean you have to use Beam everywhere. Code is code, just test it. <laughs> Go is pretty good about this with its tight integration between tools and the testing package and overall idioms for testing. Unit testing the parts of your do funds independently helps narrow down where any problems are coming from without worrying about the distributed part. And believe me, the distributed part can cause a lot of problems. However, what if there are problems with the distributed part? How can you tell? How can you find them? What about execution time? Well, adding counters or other metrics to your do funds can help. Let's take a look at the code for our pixel combiner. So we go here. Say goodbye to our word. And scroll down. So here's our trace function. As you can see, it's populating the scene. And then it's just tracing each of these rays individually and just returning that straight out. Ray in, color out. Easy peasy. But here's our combine function. Uh, I've added two counters here, one for each of add input and merge accumulators. And we increment them uh, on their calls. So that way I can see how many times each one is called by the system. This will help verify the optimization I made earlier, aligning pixel samples together. But if you take a look at the implementations for add input and merge accumulators, you can see that they're identical. So this is a little odd because why have an add input at all? In the Go SDK, if you only have a merge accumulators method, it will be used as an add input method. So I didn't really need to do this, but I did it so that I can see how many times they were called individually, uh, which helps me track to see whether um, my improvement actually worked or not. Um, all that's needed for a counter or other beam metrics is to define the metric and then pass in a framework provided context uh, into your, uh, into your uh, method. You just request it and the system will just handle it. Easy peasy. So how do you see the counters? Well, for that, we can use local portable runners and we can, uh, to see what things are happening during some job executions. Uh, some portable runners can run locally, uh, sending up a job service for you to submit jobs to, and then it will execute them all locally. Uh, these include the Flink runner, or running as a local instance, or even the Python portable runner, which I use a lot for debugging. Uh, this will exercise your code fully in the same way they would on a remote worker on regular full-on things, or regular full-on runners like running it on a Flink cluster. Uh, this will do it all on top of Beam. Uh, this means that coders will be exercised and data will be serialized, which direct runners like the Go direct runner uh, often omit. It's better to see the failures sooner rather than later. later. Uh, the main thing you should be wary of is that if you're using something on a local runner, you should use a smaller data set so that you can iterate a little faster. And then, what is this loopback mode and why should you care? Well, to understand loopback mode, first we need to know how runners execute things on workers. 
Oh, let me get out of your way here. Uh, there we go. Usually, pipeline execution happens like this. Your main program builds the pipeline. It sends that and the worker artifact to the runner via the job management API. The runner spins up containers for its worker half and our SDK half to work together on worker machines. It then sends that worker uh, bundles of work until the job terminates. All of this can happen on multiple different machines all over the place. You could instead run all of this locally on one machine. But by default, the workers are going to still be all in containers. You could expose, or expose ports to get access to the container internals, but this can be difficult to manage. Instead, the solution to this is loopback mode. In loopback mode, the main program spins up a worker cluster server and then builds its own worker processes. And this is all happening in process in the main program. Similarly, the runner can do the same thing with its own work if it likes. Uh, this avoids obfuscating things through a container and gives you special access to your main program, which you can then use to attach a debugger or print statements or even writing profiles. Or, in one of my other favorites, outputting files to your local file system. So, Pictured here is a pipeline uh, running against a portable runner in loopback mode. So you can see that it's a portable runner because it's asking for the universe, a universal runner, uh, and it's connecting to a local endpoint running on a separate uh, command line. And all that you need to do is specify uh, set the environment type to loopback uh, when starting the job with the compatible runner, like Blink or Spark. This also lets one run uh, pipelines with local file output. I've already mentioned that. Uh, and then you can see over here that it's a uh, starting loopback mode. So sometimes the runners will not let you do this, of course. Uh, this will not work if everything is set up as a distributed service and it's on a separate machine versus uh, happening on a local machine. Uh, you'll get error messages if that's the case is you're not necessarily exposing ports from your local work machine to the internet to talk to some development cluster somewhere. So local, this, the, the name of the game here is local. Um, but one of my favorite parts about loopback mode and local execution is that the main program becomes the worker, so you can do local profiling. Profiling the worker code for either CPU or memory usage can be very difficult in production settings many containers to dig into, or you might not have access to the workers at all. So how do you find your bottlenecks? The Java and Beam SDKs have some counters to, on do funds and P collections, but that doesn't narrow things down entirely. It only gets to you as far as which do fun is slow. But what about what part of my code is slow? So for that, we can use loopback mode to make pro uh, profiling easier. How does that work with Go? It's pretty simple, actually. Uh, we add a little small bit of code into our program built into the uh, Go runtime packages, uh, then execute loopback mode to get our, uh, our profile file. And then once, we, then once we have, uh, we can make sure we have pprof and graphviz installed. We can then use the pprof tool to inspect our program. So let me show you the code where that is happening. Code. Here we're importing the pprof package. We're defining a flag to say where our file is. And then if we actually have the CPU profile file, uh, we create it and start profiling. We then defer the stop profiling uh, until the program ends. If you're less well-versed in Go, defer is a Go keyword that delays execution of a function call until the current function scope ends. Uh, since this is the main, uh, it will uh, defer until right before uh, this, uh, this curly brace here, 
when the profile ends. Um, da, 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 da. So let's see how that looks for something in the running with the Go Direct runner. So here's a profile I've taken earlier. You can see that it executed things. You can see uh, our counter here, uh, pixel add input. It uh, counted uh, some two million odd uh, additions with no merges. Pretty neat. Single threaded because it's the direct runner. It will probably only ever do add inputs. Um, but if we go to our uh, web, web view here, we can see a live view of our profile. So this is the profile web view. Uh, it will uh, it shows pretty much what we expect that most of the time is spent in our trace function, about 80% of it with only around 10 odd percent dealing with garbage collector. If you don't like the flame view, uh, you can always just go to the regular graph view. And you can see that it's uh, doing the same thing. A lot of our optimization could be happening in the query method for our array marching. But this isn't telling us too much where we need to know. I just need, it looks like I need to uh, do some uh, ray acceleration structures to make this more efficient. But overall, at least all the work is happening in my code and not in overhead in the framework. Da, 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 da. And then over here, this is a, another view uh, from uh, the actual portable runner. Uh, you can see the stack looks a little bit different here. It's still significantly less garbage collection overhead and all that. Um, but otherwise, we're just still executing the stack. Most of the code is still running through a uh, trace. So I have some optimization work to do. I've already got ideas, but that's a different talk. So on to distributed runners. Well, uh, does this actually work on distributed runners? Uh, in my case, uh, since uh, Cloud Dataflow currently employs me, uh, I ran it on Dataflow. And that's pretty darn easy as well. Uh, we set the runner to Dataflow. We set our project. GCS staging account, or we have a GCS location for our staging, our, uh, our binary and other artifacts. We set the region, job name, and because the Go SDK is not currently supported by Dataflow, uh, we manually specify an SDK container. Supported SDKs typically can just pull down one Dataflow provides for them. But this option is always available for uh, having our SDK boot container. I wouldn't use the data flow with the Go SDK for anything production critical yet. Please wait for official support. Disclaimer. <laughs> Here's the UI, though, from one of the finished jobs. Uh, as you can see, oh, I'm in the way here. Let me uh, get out of the way. That one. Uh, you can see it's a pretty straight line job. It worked successfully. It used some number of resources, ran in about 11 or so minutes and it might be hard to see but compared to the 132 million uh, ad uh, ad inputs we've called uh, we ended up with uh, 74 uh, merges so i would say my optimization worked just fine uh, we can then move off to uh, some other things dataflow tells us uh, we can see that it scaled up to uh, 20 machines uh, and took only 10 minutes to go through that. It wasn't a particularly large image, not that many samples. So how about a larger job where we ramped things up to 1,000 samples per pixel? In this case, it went up to 77 workers. You'll have to uh, take uh, my word for that one. Uh, not too shabby. And if you look at the counters, 530 million uh, add input calls and only 400 merge pixel mergers. I'm pretty sure that this would work. As an aside, I uh, did a little back of the envelope math on how much this particular job would have cost if uh, I were footing the bill, and it would have been about three dollars. I could do, I can do a better. I can do better. I can make that cheaper. Um, but for those of you interested, uh, here's the result of this rendering. Thank you.
Uh, as you can see, significantly less noise with a lot more samples. But uh, this takes me to the end of the talk. Uh, special, uh, let's, oh, before I say the other thanks, uh, let's just go over the learning goals. I hope you got, came away with a light understanding of ray tracers. I hope you see how easy it is to write one with the Beam Go SDK. Uh, third, you got to see how splittable do funds can work with ray tracing. And you got to see how I iterate on the ray tracer using counters, loopback mode, and CPU profiling. And finally, you got a little bit of proof that it works on a distributed runner like Google Cloud Dataflow. Uh, special thanks to Fabian Sanglard's deconstruction of Andrew Kensler's path tracer on a postcard. That's right, most of that code was very, very dense C, plus, or C code written on the back of a postcard. Uh, without which I'd have based uh, my ray tracer on some other thing to translate it and to go. Um, thank you to the Beam Summit organizers, and special thanks to viewers like you. Uh, I've been Robert Burke, and this has been a simple ray tracer with the Apache Beam Go SDK. Have a great day. Cheers.